This is a University of Otago podcast. Kia ora everybody. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of our director at the moment who is in the North Island. Um, I'm Linda and i um, sort of been here on a regular basis along with Nicholas every year and, uh, and Johnny. So um, I just welcome to you all because I know it's really cold outside and um, I hope you enjoy today's talk. I know I always find it incredibly fascinating and I'm going to leave it up to Nicholas McBride to introduce everybody. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Linda. <coughs> Um, this forum this afternoon is, actually, is an opportunity for us to actually hear from the fellows about their journey and their creative process. It's, um, it's sort of like a show and tell, but without the show, because um, they would, they'd, they've all got different things to show. And indeed, um, during the course of this year, uh, previously this year and maybe later in the year, um, the fellows um, will be presenting their works in various guises and places around the city, or well, maybe not. But anyway, today is just about, um, is, a, is a talk fest. Um, also, um, if at any time during this afternoon's forum you have difficulty hearing us, any of us, just shout. This is a casual uh, occasion and we can, uh, we can turn the microphones up or we can speak more slowly or more clearly for you. So don't feel you have to strain. Just give us a shout. So um, the um, university fellowships have been in existence for 50 years, some a little bit more, some a little bit less. In fact, I think the Burns is 55, 56, I think now. Um, and, and they are a bit of a testimony, I think, to the uh, University of Otago's commitment to the creative process. And Charles Brash, back in 1959, wrote the following in, I think it was in Landfall, he said, a part of a university's process, a part of a university's proper business is to act as a nurse to the arts, or more exactly, to the imagination as it expresses itself in the arts and sciences. Imagination may flourish anywhere, but it should flourish as a matter of course in a university, for it is only through imaginative thinking that society grows materially and intellectually. And th that quote is actually on the um, web's page of the, um, the fellowship. And um, I guess that if you read the uh, newspaper, you would, um, with the current um, situation at the, in the humanities division at the university, one would hope that the, um, the fellows, fellowships will remain um, uh, sacred and will be there for another 50 years. So, yeah, yeah, good. Yes, um, don't want to get into politics. Um, so I'd like, uh, firstly, I should, well, there's four of the five um, fellows is here today. Uh, we have an apology from the Caroline Plummer uh, Fellow in Community Dance. Val Smith is um, under the weather today and can't be with us. So I would like to introduce to you from your right, Barbara Else, who is the children's writer, is a big long name for that, but I'll leave Barbara to uh, fill you in on that one. Um, and then we've got uh, Chris Gendel, who's the Mozart Fellow, and then Miranda Parks, who is the Hodgkins, and uh, Victor Roger, who is the Burns Fellow this year. So, did I get that right? Yeah, good. Um, um, so I'd like to just get the afternoon off to a start by asking each of the fellows to um, just um, tell us a little bit about their um, career to date um, and the journey that they are on as a, as a creator, as an artist. So. Barbara. <laughs> It doesn't matter where we start. <laughs> I did say that I would start at an end, probably, so nobody obviously wanted to sit on the end. <laughs> well, I'll start with the very long name of, of my fellowship and get that out of the way. It's the Creative New Zealand University of Otago Children's Writer in Residence. 
and one thing I think is, is particularly wonderful about it is it is the only, well, it's the only children's writing fellowship in the country, and it's also um, the, the link between Otago University and Creative New Zealand in, in funding it, I, I think, is, is, is very special, and I'm enormously grateful to both, um, both wings of, of, of the beast, um, the fabulous beast that is this fellowship. Um, my career to date, well, it's, um, I really want to talk about that? Mm -hmm, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've written <clears throat> for adults as well as children ever since I began writing, which is quite a long time ago now. Um, had things published for both children and adults. But then um, my first novel was for adults, and that kind of tipped me towards writing really mainly for adults for, um, for several years. In about 2008, I began writing a new novel for children, and that led me quite by accident, really. I didn't plan to do it, into writing a whole quartet um, about the same um, environment, fictional um, world. And the, um, the project I'm working on this year is, is another novel for children, but it's, it's, it's a standalone, um, not in a, uh, completely separate from that quartet. Um, is that enough? It's a start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barb. <coughs> Uh, well, I'm, um, I came down here from Wellington. I lived in Wellington now for since about 1980, although I, I didn't grow up there. I uh, returned there um, as an adult in 1980. And from about 1988, I think, been living there with my um, husband, Chris Else, who is here today. We came down together. Um, at the beginning of this year, um, I stayed in the delightful Robert Lord Cottage, which some of you might know, um, in Titan Street, right in the middle of the university quarter. Now, I had been a student here at Otago, um, and for the first few weeks we were there, it was so quiet in the student quarter, and I thought, <laughs> what's happened? <laughs> what's happened? They're not students around here. You know, they've got worse than, you know, in terms of, you know, not, they're not being proper students, it's all too quiet and good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we, we've now bought a, actually bought a house here in Dunedin, and, um, and so we're now Dunedinites, and I'm feeling sort of increasingly day by day even, you know, happier and happier about that, so um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dunedin. That's good. <laughs> Chris. Um, so I'm a composer, and I'm from uh, Hamilton originally, uh, but I went to high school and undergrad, and um, I did my undergrad in, in Wellington, so Wellington feels like home for me. Um, I did some study as well overseas. I lived uh, in upstate New York, a little town called Ithaca, and then, um, and then in New York City and a few other different places before I came back um, a few years ago. Uh, I'm not a performer. I do a little conducting now. I don't play any music. Um, I, I um, played piano and a couple of other things when I was a kid, but I was a t terrible pianist and, <laughs> and an even worse piano student because my sight reading was very good, so I never practiced. I just sight read my lessons. I was, I was the worst kind of piano student ever. So I guess it's quite interesting. Um, I think a lot of people associate composition with the noise you make, or being a composer with the noise you make, and nothing I do, including conducting, makes any noise. So that's an interesting aspect. Um, is there anything else? That you, yeah. So, um, as I am, um, since you're no good at making noise, um, <laughs> no good at playing noise, um, how come you're now creating noise? Um, so, when did you f realize that? that you were rubbish as a performer. <laughs> oh, did I say that? <laughs> um, so why is, do you have to create? Yeah, well, I've been doing this for probably 20 years. Since he I was has a, to create. Right? Yeah, since I was a teenager. So, yeah. um, and it's a lovely... 
it's composition is a beautiful thing because it's a it's a mechanism for cre creativity. You write something down, you you capture your own imagination, and and you make something visual out of it. But it's also social. You have this interaction with, for me, luckily, these brilliant musicians who can pull it off the page and and share it around the room. So it's mm. something something quite special. Mm. That's lovely. Mm. Your career and your journey to date. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for coming in, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I am really honoured to have the Francis Hodgkins Fellowship because it's a very special opportunity um, to work on my practice for a whole year. And um, it's amazing to be sort of acknowledged in that way after um, working as an artist for about 12 years since I finished um, studying at Canterbury University. Um, and it's been great to meet the other fellows as well from the, um, I don't always communicate um, a lot with artists from other disciplines, so it's really nice to have them um, know that they're here alongside me. Um, I'm from Christchurch, and um, I've been up and down a little bit this year because I'm expecting a baby <laughs> as well, so quite a big year. Um, and that's, that's, that's affected um, my practice in that there's lots of things I can't do because usually I just jump into the studio with all the paint and toxins around me and that's not something I can do at the moment so I think it's um, been quite good because it's led me to look at some alternative techniques and processes in the practice and um, start building maybe a broader repertoire in my work. Um, so yeah, but it's it's still early days. I've got my show at the Hocken Library here, which is next March. Um, and I'm looking forward to kind of bringing all my research and work from this year together then. Um, my practice is um, it's painting, but it's definitely um, sort of got a foot in sculpture as well and um, I use architectural contexts to resolve the work as well so it kind of has always sort of questioned its, the boundaries of painting and what you can do um, within that discipline. <coughs> so yeah. Has it been frustrating for you, but you said that painting is the, was your principal um, medium, has it been frustrating that you've had to been forced to maybe look at uh, different um, genres now that because of the fumes pregnancy. and pregnancy and stuff? Is that is that forced you to go somewhere where you didn't want to go? or um, No, you... it sort of um, forced me to go somewhere where I've been wanting to go, oh, okay. which is really nice. Okay. Yeah, so using oh, yeah. Um, watercolour and oh. ink and oh. um, other things that... Uh, I probably didn't have as much familiarity and so it's a bit of a brave kind of leap to go towards them so and I've had to which is yeah it's, I think it's a good it's kind of boundary mm. Mm. Victor Roger hello Thanks, fellow Tina Tato Kato everyone Taro for Lava I am Victor Roger I am a son of Samoa by way of my late father and a son of Scotland by way of my late grandmother. Uh, Christchurch boy, born and bred. Um, journalist, straight out of high school. I did that for three years on a daily newspaper, then did my OE. Uh, and during that OE I started to write what became my first play, Sons, which was performed in 95, just over 20 years ago. Um, since then I have worked a little bit as an actor, but mostly as a writer. Um, from 2000 till last year, I wrote scripts for Shortland Street on and off. Um, but against that, I kept up um, writing plays. And now that I'm pushing 50, I'm writing a lot faster than I used to. <laughs> um, you know, I do have a very strong agenda to write s projects that have um, Pacific characters um, at the heart of them, where they are the protagonist versus supporting another narrative. Uh, I'm really, I, I'm really um, happy.
happy that I got the Burns Fellowship this year. You know, I'm the first uh, recipient of, of Samoan descent and only the second of Pacific descent. Uh, and it feels like a really good time to be at the university. <coughs> um, you know, diversity has, is such a, a big D word these days. And I think in this, whether you buy into that argument or not, um, and I, I do in my own way, I think it's really good to have a different point of view um, at the moment. And um, I'm working on a few things. Uh, I did my first little piece of fiction this year, which got published in Landfall, which is a whole different kettle of fish. Um, and yeah, I've spent a lot of time thinking this year and dabbling, um, but one project that I've, that's as much as I understand my process, which is not very well. <laughs> um, I have one project that is tumbling, tumbling out of me at the moment. And uh, I was saying earlier today, the thing I think I almost enjoy the most about writing is when I surprise myself as a writer. And with this particular piece, um, I've been surprising myself quite a lot. So it's um, a really nice place to be in. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Um, the um, creative process can be r rather scary, I imagine. Um, the uh, blank canvas and how you start, um, where the inspiration come from, where the inspiration comes from, and the methodology which you use to get out of yourself into your medium. How do you approach that? How do you do that? How does it work? Where do you start? Are you gonna yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, yeah. I've got no idea, really. And, um, <laughs> you know, I never used to like teaching, uh, but uh, particularly I do like to teach Pacific kids these days because I realise that I've learned some stuff. That's how I look at it. But I, I still am figuring it out. But, um, you know, the easy part for me is the idea. The hard part is taking the idea from A to Z and seeing it through to the end. Um, and all I know is that sometimes I get to the end and I'm there. <laughs> but I, I don't know how I do it. I mean, um, some of you may or may not have come to some of the play readings that I've held here of my work throughout the year. And um, we did my first play a couple of months ago, Sons. And um, listening to it again, because it's like 21 now, I was like, yeah, it's, it's pretty good, Victor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly what I liked was hearing how I'd captured my father's voice, because it's a real father-son play. But I've got no idea how I did that. Like when I hear it back, when I read it back, I'm like, I don't know how that happened. It just happens. It's a, it's a mystery to me, but it just happens. Yeah. I think in, in music, though, this uh, the, um, the sort of binary opposition of inspiration and technique or, you know, um, what you work with and how you move it around, um, it, it's quite interesting and, and quite cloudy. And I think, um, and maybe what you're talking about, the sort of mystery of how did I do this, is what gives all the great composers their voice. It's not, it's not what notes they choose. It's how they move them around. It's it's the, um, it's it's in the doing. It's in the working out rather than in the in the kind of um, voice of God sort of. Uh, um, the kind of germ that drops in, into their brain, it's, it's more the way they kind of work it out on the page. And that's really interesting, it's, that, that's where kind of character comes from, in music anyway, I'm not sure about in writing mm. so much. So, so in, but musically, do you, do you, does, where does it start? Where, I mean, if you've just, if you've, well, maybe it's a commission, maybe it's not, but what's the, what's the first thing that happens do you write something down, or do you just sit yourself down at the piano, which you can't play very well, <laughs> or, or what? There's no answer to this, really. Okay. Yeah, but um, lately I've, I've been um, listening to the world around me a little bit more closely, and, and I've started to, um, with the use of technology, make uh, um, transcriptions of tiny little aspects um, that, that crop up in my everyday life. Uh, it'll, it could be um, something like a tui call, which is very beautiful and very musical, mm -hmm. or it could be um, a pattern of speech. It could be something quite um, mundane, even. Um, and but by looking, transcribing it, so working out uh, how it looks in notation, but also looking inside the sound itself and um, finding the internal componentry of the sound that makes it 
that gives it that colour, that gives it that shape, uh, is really interesting and there's often a lot of uh, chaos and a lot of tension within a particular sound um, that, that you can play with and you can sort of draw out and that's what I've been doing recently. The last piece I finished was a violin concerto uh, for, a, for a friend who's, who's a very good, very good player um, and the the starting material for that came from the first couple of bars of a very obscure disco song, <laughs> and there's no way anyone would ever recognise it because it, <laughs> because I that's just I, what I've taken from it is as colour rather than rather than any kind of style, and that's I think interesting as a as a motivation. Mm. So Barbara, do you start a book or a is it is it <coughs> does it just does it grow or does it is it formed before you put <coughs> pen to paper or what do you do nowadays? <coughs> um, no, I I never really know how the end will work out or ev even if there will be an end. I think um, even at this stage, having written a lot of novels by now, um, because I'm on my thirteenth, um, you've always got to. You've always got to understand on some level that this one might not work. Um, you can't get smug about it because it just it just might not happen. Um, the ideas start to the ideas don't really start to grow. They the right ones suddenly start to come together. Um, for me, it's not just one idea. You've got to have something that will spark against that first one and then other ones sort of accrete mm. towards it. Mm. Um, and it can take a long time to find the voice. Um, and it's interesting that you've, you know, you've, you've both talked about voice, finding the voice. Um, for me, that's sometimes the last thing that happens before everything is in place. Um, there's, there's quite a, 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 well, it might, might interest some of you to, to, to the journey of this particular book I'm writing, on, writing at the moment. Um, I had an idea and I got about 30,000 words with it and I thought, right, I'm about to plunge into the next 10 or 12,000 words, which will be the finale. So what does my main character have? What, what is at stake for that main character at this point? And I thought, oh, actually not nearly as much as another minor character. I thought, don't, don't worry about that. Go, 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 go to bed. Have a good night's sleep. And in the morning I woke up and I thought, yep, I've got the wrong main character. So oh, I had to start no. again. And, you know, almost immediately the voice began to develop and everything began to develop. And that was when I sent in my application for the Children's Writing Fellowship. <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the first... The, the, they didn't actually ask for a sample of the writing, but I, but I had written the first three pages at that point and it, I thought, you know, this, this is worth showing them. And I, you know, I've rewritten it several times since then, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I was finally onto it. It had taken all that time. So that's, that's just the way the process is. You, you can't predict what will happen. Mm. So the process is different every time you actually do it, isn't it? There's no sort of yeah. set stages of doing anything. Yeah. 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 Possibly like a common factor with all the arts would be, like Chris was talking about before, that um, sense of engagement with where you're at, like whether it's in an intellectual environment or a physical, sensual environment, mm. you sort of need to be awake. Mm. And then um, after that, setting up the conditions for your work to be heard. So, you know, for me that would be um, going into my studio <laughs> or reading and making the time and space and making sure that um, you can grab those things when they start coming out. And that you, because if you set up the conditions for it, it'll just, it will happen, yeah, on its own, in a way. And I guess, once again, it, it, each time it will be different from the time before. It's, there's no sort of set yeah. formula. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I'm wondering um, if I could ask you um, who your work is actually for. Are you doing this for yourself, for your public, or for your audience? And does that affect your creative process? Mm. 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 
Good one. question. Good question. Good question. <laughs> Shall I say it again? Yeah. <laughs> That's so cute. It was. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who is your work for? Is it for yourself, for your public or your audience, whoever that might be? And does that affect the way you actually, your process, what you're actually doing? Are you, yeah, are you doing it for yourself or for somebody else? So who's in your mind when you're doing this stuff? M myself, I have to say. Oh, you're quite selfish then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't only child till I was 16, so, <laughs> you know. Victor's um, selfish. <laughs> no, it is, it is myself. I mean, um, audience, or, although I must say in the last, say, six or seven years, probably the last six years, I have started to think about who I am trying to engage or wanting to engage. Um, and who my audience is and who they're not. I mean, um, <clears throat> but generally it starts with something that I want to say and I want people to hear it, whether they come and listen to it or not is another question. But um, I was saying before, for my last three plays which have been on in Auckland, um, <clears throat> my audience has always been mixed, always, you know, white and, and Pacific Māori, but it started to skew young and brown. And it's been very exciting for me to see that audience engage with the work. Mm -hmm. It's not a traditional theatre-going audience, because there's not an awful lot mm -hmm. that I think particularly speaks to them or their experience. So that, that's, that is something in the back of my mind. And that came from <clears throat> the one play that I have written that hasn't been produced, um, which I'd, I'd seen. It's the one time that I kind of listen to my head instead of my guts. And I'd, I'd just seen August Osage County, mm -hmm. which some of you may know on Broadway, and wanted to kind of do a Samoan version of that. <laughs> and so I kind of shoehorned my original idea into making this great big, you know, <laughs> meaty Polynesian epic set in Samoa with these badly behaved yeah, mixed race yeah, yeah. kids. Yeah. Um, and it was just a load of old cobblers. And <laughs> um, because it was quite contrived mm. and also as one of my friends pointed out, and this, I tried to shove the tsunami and Samoa into it for the, the, the coda, um, with the best of intentions, but it really didn't work. And no one cried, which they should have if I'd done it right. Um, but someone pointed out to me, yeah, I hadn't, the, I hadn't really thought about the audience for it. That, that was one time where, yeah, sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. But mm. I think of myself. You do need to think about the audience yeah. at some point, usually, don't you? Well, you do want it to be. Well, I mean, See. you just said that you know that, the, um, that your inspiration in recent times has bec is your your writing with a particular audience, although it's you to start it's with, a but you're mindful of yeah. where it's going to end up. Yeah. Are you mindful of where your work's meant to be going? Not at or the would like to at, go? Not at the beginning, because it's more to do with um, I'm developing a relationship with the work myself, and then when I feel so excited about what it starts saying back to me then I feel like I would like to share, share it with people mm -hmm. um, yeah that's mm. pretty much it so, so <laughs> who are you doing it for um, I don't mean to get too semantic about it, but um, for my own for my own purpose, I um, so. <laughs> university fellows. You can do <laughs> I try and um, replace the word audience with listener, and the reason for this is for me, audience connotes kind of some kind of uh, commercial or statistical value. For me, if I had to think about how many people were going to show up, how much money they were spending and how loud they clapped, it would be crippling. I'd never get anything done if that was like a primary concern for my work. Okay. Oh. But I think a lot about um, communication. Most of what I do is for performers who are not me uh, and, um, and because of that I have to communicate something to them. So the, the, the page communicates music to them and from, from that they communicate something to the listener. And, and I think that mechanism is interesting and there's a lot to play with and, and I come from a history of composers who have played with this in a very um, sort of mysterious way. Composers love mystery and they love being able, the, the kind of, um, the light and shade of, of what we can do, what we can hide from the listener, what we can reveal to them by hiding, hiding things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, mystery that's, that's wrapped up in that and that's something that's sort of beautiful about music. So that doesn't really answer your question, but there's there's a there's definitely a mechanism, and I think hard quite hard about the mechanism. I just don't. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think there's a single result. Mm. Or a but single you're, but you're not actually just doing it for yourself. You're not doing it just because you have to. Well, obviously, I'm I'm a listener too. So yeah, yeah okay. so I'm responding to to, to yeah. what I hear. So. Okay. So are you, are you mindful of where your work is going to end up in your creative process? Um, yes, I, especially writing for children and especially mm. writing for the age group that I'm working for and that's children from junior fiction from sort of seven years through to 12 or 13. So I'm very mindful of the kind of story that... Um, I suppose for want of a better, it sounds a bit wanky, but, but nourishes them somehow, that, that talks, talks to them about what their preoccupations are at that age, and that is, that, you know, they're, they're beginning to want to explore away from the home and the safety of the home, um, but they also want to know that, that there is safety. Um, so that's important. Um, you will also know that that age group is doesn't have a lot of experience, perhaps not a lot of experience in reading, and perhaps not a lot of life experience either. So you've got to be very careful the way you uh, you handle some matters. Um, so there's, there's that. I, I think children's writers do have to be particularly aware of the potential readership uh, in a way that if when I'm writing for adults, I you know. That's, that's, you know, let it rip, yes. Um, but at the same time, with each new book, I, there has to be some particular technical challenge or I'm just not interested in it. Um, so what, is, what does that mean? Um, a technical challenge, well, can I handle... Um, create well with, with the first fantasy novel? Could I actually write a fantasy novel that would that would be different enough but still be part of the genre. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone tries to write a fantasy novel at some point and you know, in my work as a manuscript assessor I see a lot of them and they're often, you know, they're, they're kind of interchangeable. And so when I was excited about writing that particular first one of mine, I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm having a ball, I'm just loving this. but. What's going to make it different? What will make it stand out, if anything can? So, so there was there was that challenge. Mm. In the book I'm working on at the moment, the challenge is setting the first quarter in different time, in different eras, of, during human history, and the rest of the novel is going to be set in in New Zealand. Now, can I manage that transition? And keep a, a kind of fantasy element going, and then play it against mm. um, contemporary reality here. And that's, you know, if I can pull it off, I'll be extremely pleased and extremely <laughs> tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it seems to me that there's actually quite a lot of research is actually required in the creative process as well. I mean, you've just mm. described that. You know, you've done some. It's set some other time, and mm. then it's set now. So you've got to. You've got to know what you're talking about to be able to pull something off that's going to be believable. Yes. So you've got to get your facts right. Yes, yeah? yes, and, and you've got to be careful to use, you know, you might find a thousand facts, but how many does your novel actually need? need. You've got to choose, choose one or two facts that will actually do a lot of work in helping to set a particular scene. Mm -hmm. So it's that filtering, I mean, you can, mm. you do lots of playwright does that. Do you that. do lots of research? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I do a lot of. <laughs> I, do, I, mean, I do a lot of reading, um, but in terms of pure research, no, not a lot. Except there was one project that I got money to do last year called Fucking Gogan, and that is Gogan from the point of view of two Tahitian girls yeah. who are being painted by Gogan. So um, that's probably the most research I've done, but mostly on Gogan, sadly, because there's not an awful lot of research out there about the his, his Tahitian subjects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But generally, I'm right what you know and inspired by what's around me. Yeah, and I guess that in itself is research, isn't it? Just being an observer, mm -hmm. listening to other people's stories and lives. Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was saying before, yes. I've got my, um, the, play, the piece I'm doing at the moment <clears throat> has three um, kids at the heart of it. And fortuitously, my four godchildren are staying with me at the moment for the school holidays. And um, 
you know, their quirks and language, which, you know, I am, you know, I forget I am 47 now, I'm not one of the kids anymore. <laughs> you know, they're speaking a foreign language, really. And it's great being around their foreign language. And um, that is absolutely seeping into the characters. And I was saying my eldest is, my eldest godchild is 16 and has suddenly uh, developed a penchant for, you know, Francois Truffaut films and David Lynch films and reading the novel of Psycho. And I mean, I'm not quite sure when that happens, but, <laughs> you know, I love it. And that, that, that is definitely feeding into one of the characters uh, in, the, in the play. Mm. Can I ask, um, when do you know that a work is complete? When do you walk out of the studio and say, that's done? Or do you keep tinkering? Mm. There's definitely a point where um, you know that it might be complete and usually then I just make myself leave the studio, shut the door and then come back the next day. I, I leave thinking it might be incredible, like the best painting that anyone's ever made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good, good. And then come back the next day and go, yep, it, it's finished and it's doing something, it's doing something. Um, it's probably not the best painting anyone ever made, but it, it's finished and I'll mm. leave it. But that's a skill that you develop yeah, over time, I right. think, mm. by making some mistakes where you go too far with things and then realise you wish you'd left it sort yeah. of a few steps back. Mm. There's a few different points where things can be finished at too, not just one. But if you can identify the first one, you're winning anyway, so right. it's yeah, a good, good place to stop. Head, yeah. 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 So Chris, what about you? When do you know a piece of piece is done, ready for the performer? Well, sometimes it's a matter of practicality, like a deadline. Uh, um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, and actually, you know, musicians and composers are quite fussy with uh, revisions usually, yeah, yeah. and so mm. I do a little of that, but not not so much. Um, but for me, I think uh, more recently, I've been more interested um, in kind of forms, that is, you know, how a piece goes, where it starts and finishes, being quite open-ended, so that there's not necessarily a feeling of closure at the, or a feeling of beginning at the start or, or end of a piece, more a feeling that, that um, the listener is kind of coming into a world and exiting it as, as it happens. Um, and I think that's sort of a little bit more organic and, um, and perhaps a little bit more complex an experience because uh, the the experience or the shape of the experience hasn't been prescribed by me it's been it's something that that kind of interacts with with their own universe and their own cosmos so that's I, I don't know if that answers your mm. question but it's um it's something that I that I think about quite a lot mm. so Barbara do you know when you when you're finished or do you get revisions from your editors who really annoy you because they tell you to do Oh, no, stuff. no. I, I, I love uh, working with an editor. Um, I find that um, that often just helps put the final creative touches to, mm. to things. Um, when I think something is near being finished, I read it aloud to myself. And with you know a novel of sixty or seventy thousand words, it can take a couple of days. I have learned not to do it over one day because you end up with a very sore face, <laughs> and a very sore, sore jaw and tongue. Um, and I always know when I read it aloud, I will find an awful lot of stuff wrong. I will find scenes that aren't really that don't finish on the right note. I will find transitions between scenes and chapters that don't work. I will find sentences that are really ugly. And I'll find things that are really hard to read aloud. And because I'm working for that particular age group, I want I want my work to be read aloud easily and, it, and to sound good. Um, because it will be read aloud. You hope, well, you certainly hope it will. <laughs> so that usually means another fairly intense draft. And at that stage, I will send it to a publisher, and, the, and then there will be editing. And as I said, I, I just love that process. So that's quite exciting, it. I guess, is it? You know, that sense of, you know, that you're nearly there. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Do you know when you're finished? Yeah, I mean, I'm very gut-led. Gut so right. I listen to my gut, and my gut will normally tell me when it's, yeah. when it's done. Mm. Certainly will tell me when it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um, uh, with with books, they they last. 
Um, but with paintings and with music, and with dance, we haven't got dance here today, um, they're, um, they're owned by somebody else, or they're, uh, you have to let them go for somebody else to make something out of, like you with your plays too. You, you get so far, and then it becomes something else, or it, it vanishes, because it only, it's, it only lasts for one hour, two hours, whatever it might be. Books there forever. A painting you maybe give away, and you've lost it. It's gone. Um, so is that is that a? I mean, I would have imagined that creating something beautiful, you want to sort of keep it for yourself forever. So are, are you able to let go? Are you able to let go? I can, I know if it's too early to let go of something because I feel wrong about it, and then usually I just need to move on to the next thing and keep working for a little bit longer, like mm. another month. And then that's old news already, what you made last month. Oh, okay. So and then it's, it's great when someone else takes it on into their home or into their life and they can have a, their own journey with it. Mm. And that, that feels really good, knowing it sort of still goes on mm. past yeah, your ownership. So in, in yeah. playwriting, you've, you've created this gem and then you've got to sure I have guys. <laughs> <laughs> then then you've got to let it go. Yes, you do. Now that's hard. That's a question. Uh, is it hard? Well, I mean, I guess um, you know, as you write, you you hear it very specifically and imagine it very specifically. But I've been really fortunate, I think, and just yes, in every instance that. I've trotted up to opening night, and um, the director that I've surrendered my work to has made it more than I imagined it could be, and um, I feel very fortunate about that. And a lot of that is, lies with um, trusting the person yeah. that you are working with. Mm -hmm. But I love, I love having felt that with everything that, that's been done, mm -hmm. stuff I didn't see. Like I had one play at the wake, the most hysterical scene in that play. Has nothing to do with my writing. It's something that the director. I hate saying that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's something that the director found that during a very heartfelt speech between a father and son, the, the very bemused grandmother started chewing on a sausage roll, <laughs> and that was all the, down to the director, and it worked perfectly and really um, supported the work. Mm -hmm. I know of some playwrights, <coughs> some playwrights who. Um, uh, sit in the uh, rehearsal studio. Yeah, I mean, I know some playwrights that direct their own work too. I think it's a mistake mm -hmm. by and large because um, then you lose that outside person who can really interrogate the work mm -hmm. and make it what the artist can't see because they're so close and mm -hmm. do have that very specific yeah. idea of what the work can be. I've seen that more often not work than I have seen it work. Yeah. Yeah. No names. No, 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 we won't. We don't need to go there. Um, um, so, do you? Are you in charge of your performance? Oh, only very occasionally, and, and actually, even as a conductor, I'm quite um, hands off when it's my own work, um, because the interpretive uh, aspect of music is really beautiful, and, and I think, like Victor said, it can sometimes be more than the sum of its parts, and. Um, and at its, when it's really working, say, you know, if there's a really great orchestra, you've got 80 people who are all committed to something, doing mm. something spectacular, so that's going to explode before your eyes. Mm. And that's, that's really beautiful. It doesn't always happen. You know, it's not everyone's always equally um, into it or <laughs> equally, uh, you know, uh, sort of engaged or equal, equally as skillful, but, but in the, the best possible scenario, and mm. I always try and write for the best possible scenario, um, that's that's pretty amazing. Mm. So that's a nervous process for you, um, sitting Re rehearsal? there. Yeah, rehearsal. Your rehearsals are, yeah. are, are the highest pressure aspect of of um, of music making. Actually, probably any performing arts. Um, and I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, classical musicians are very expensive, and so there's a lot of money wrapped yes. up in, in rehearsal, and yes. so. Um, so big it might yes, be. The, there isn't a lot of time dedicated to rehearsal. It has to be pretty spot on, um, and so there's a lot of pressure. But it can also be the most exciting time of music making. Much more exciting than concerts, because uh, when it's all going well, it feels like 
it feels like a, a great big wonderful family mm-hmm. and um and that's it's un- uncommon but when it, when it works it's it's magic it's really magic mm-hmm. and i guess as an author your books line your shelves and you can have a sense of satisfaction about that because they're there for forever well, one yeah. thing one thing that I'd like to say is how much a good designer and a good <laughs> artist um, can can add to your work. I mean, it, it really does enhance the writing, I think. And and with, for instance, with the fantasy quartet, I think the the, the artist brought so much that that did help enhance it. He he saw and really enjoyed the steampunk element that. And, and he brought that out in the very first yeah. book, and and when I was writing the second one in, in the series, I thought, oh, now I, I can I can build on that steampunk element, and and that became so there was a um, you know good um, cross fertilisation mm. going on there. Mm. So you know working working with other artists in, in other areas, I, I think is is incredibly valuable mm. to to any anyone. Yeah. Yes, that's just what you were saying, wasn't it? That the, the sausage roll experience was something that somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah. similarly, for my last three plays, I've. Um, always commissioned a uh, an artist whose work I like to do the image for our the graphics, our, for the poster, the poster. and I've, I've really enjoyed having those relationships with those different artists including Ane Tonga who used to work here, Tongan artist she did the last um, image oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. and that's, gosh that's, oh, that's another matter altogether isn't it, the, the, the graphic image for a, for a play or for a book cover mm. it's so important it is, mm. it is Another discussion. Um, mm. So I want to ask now, do you look back on um, any of your earlier work and wish you'd done it differently? Um, <laughs> or not put it out to the public? Is there any of that ever happened? Yep. Yep? Yep. yep. My very first children's book, um, which I wrote while I was concentrating really on, on adult novels, but I had an idea for a children's book, and, um, and it was published. And that's the only one that I think didn't let it get funny enough. I should have done another major draft, really, and and brought out a lot more humour. Um, I was learning. I was still feeling my way into how to handle humour. I think. Mm. Um, so was that was that about you, or was that about the fashion of the time, or a publisher who was just saw an opportunity because of its? If you look at it now and think that it could have been better, then why wasn't it? I think it was a combination of those things. Mm. Um, I don't think I knew... I had written for children. I'd written a lot, lot of plays for children, and they'd been funny. But I just... I don't know. I was just... Um, oh, my husband's sitting there. Have you got an answer <laughs> to why that particular book was just a little bit doer? Was I taking... My, it was a, a bit, bit doer. doer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one little boy told me that it was the best book he'd ever read, but he was a little boy I didn't like much at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to cater for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, have you, have you uh, um, let stuff out to the world that you would now wish that you hadn't? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's partly... Uh, I was c- kind of lucky at the time that I had some nice opportunities to do things that were quite public and... and um, I was still young, and the music's just not that great. And and about um, what year are we in? About sort of nine years ago, I went through quite a big change in the way I write, and um, and my language changed quite a lot. Mm. And um, so from there, there on in, I'm fine with everything. Everything's fine. Um, but but before that, it's it's a bit um, different voice. You had. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a, it's a, it grates on me, and so, um, <laughs> but those pieces still get played, and I feel a bit, it always feels a bit iffy for me. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that is actually probably a lot of composers have yeah. had that experience, mm. you know, where they, well, I think of one in particular, mm. Durafle, who mm. didn't, wouldn't let any of his music out until he was absolutely happy with it, and as a result, there's yeah. only a tiny, tiny opus numbers on his work. So do you ever feel that, oh, I shouldn't have let that one see the light of day? No, I don't spend any time looking (laughs) back um, at what I have done because I'm usually so involved in what I'm doing Mm. currently. Mm. And so there's nothing that I would regret putting out there. 
but at the same time I'm never completely happy with anything because that's what keeps you moving on to the next thing um, so that you go through a reflective process at, after you've put an exhibition together or and then take some learnings from that into the next thing mm. each time. So with, with an exhibition which could cover a, quite a long period of time, is that right? A long uh, period of creative process time. As you get more um, along your career perhaps it's less time because mm. you might start off having one exhibition a year when you're at art school or early mm. on and then you might have sort of three a year as you and, mm. and different kinds of exhibitions too they might be um, in a public gallery like this or um, commercial spaces or um, yeah projects mm. 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 So, I can't remember what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you are you a happy man? Of course, <laughs> I'm amazing. Um, <coughs> with everything that I, you've done, I yeah, I don't agree anything. It's sort of no. like what Miranda said. I think even particularly that one that didn't work was really instructive. You know, so. But that work that didn't work. Mm. Um, is it likely that it's ever going to see the light of day? Mm -hmm. Absol absolutely. As it, as, it, as it was, even, even, even in its bad mm -hmm. state? Oh, or well, I wasn't... You didn't oh, say, I, I didn't say it. It wasn't sorry. bad. Though. It wasn't <laughs> bad. <laughs> it was actually quite good. But it was a little bit contrived. You know, I call it when I had my attack of the August Osage counties. That's oh, what right, I call that it. One. Okay. Um, but so is that going to be performed... It's, so this is just your critical analysis of it? That it well, it was, I realised that the engine was faulty. I just didn't quite understand how to fix it and it's only relatively recently because this is like maybe 2010 that was performed at Auckland Theatre Company to a, a thing called The Next oh, yeah. Stage yeah. where you get a whole uh, two weeks of actors and directors to work mm. on your script and um, yeah I'm a bit slow like that sometimes because um, it only occurred to me recently what was wrong with the engine and the, the, the thing that was wrong was I ignored my initial impulse which was to make it an out and out comedy whereas I tried to layer it with meaning that didn't deserve to warrant being here. Yeah. yeah. And it's a little, in terms of um, being a bit slow, you know, plays come when they come for me, and there's um, probably my, academically, the one all the academics like is My Name is Gary Cooper, and that was something I wrote very quickly, like 60 pages of one year, and then someone said, what are you trying to say? And I couldn't answer that for five years, so I didn't work on it. But then I went, oh, I know, and then there was another week five years yeah. later, mm -hmm. where I finished it. So really, physically, it was two weeks of writing, but over a five-year period. Mm -hmm. That was a digression. Mm -hmm. So with the Assange play, is that, is that, will you, will you fiddle with, will you, sorry, will you oh refine it later, or just never, or? Oh yeah, absolutely, it absolutely. Is, absolutely. It's like an idea worth exploring still. It's very strong. Okay. I mean, that idea came from, um, speaking of inspiration, um, when I had a Fulbright to the University of Hawaii. And the two people that I hung out with mostly were mixed race Samoan Balangi like me. Um, all of us had, uh, well, different relationships to our Samoan parents and the culture. And I, I was like, gosh, what would it look like if the three of us, and we were all appallingly behaved people, ended up in Samoa, <laughs> what, what havoc could we wreak? And really we would be white tourists once removed. And that was the initial <laughs> impulse, and um, that's what I absolutely need to return to and get rid of the August Osage Countyisms. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. The um, the f um, the University of Otago fellowships um, are very uh, have a huge amount of freedom in them, in so far as each of the fellows is not actually required to produce anything during the time of their one year or half year tenure. So. I'd like to ask each of the fellows whether that's an um, impediment or a great sense of freedom that you actually don't have to do anything while you're here. Oh, sorry, you don't have to actually <laughs> produce anything uh, to, to get it, you know, marked or ticked off, or to prove that it's been uh, uh, value for money for the University of Otago. I'd like to take that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I've never met a deadline that I couldn't miss, so. Um, <laughs> Getting a residency like this is, it's a real gift because the pressure is off. 
I, you know, I actually don't respond that well to deadlines, having even though I worked for Shoreland Street for quite a, a time, mm -hmm. um, and I was always late then too. <laughs> but um, yeah, just the, having the pressure off mm -hmm. is fantastic for somebody like me, where you, you're not expected to deliver something. I mean, I expect I'll end up probably with two new works and and two reworked old works by the end of it, like quite a good mm -hmm. output, but. Um, the, the, yes, it's great not having that pressure, and I think that's how it should be because it just gives you that space to think, play around, go down dead ends that may be dead ends, or explore new stuff. You know, I mean, I don't know if I would have come up with the one that I'm doing now if I hadn't had that that freedom just to follow my nose. I went down to Invercargill following my nose to watch some um, uh, marching championships down in Invercargill. You know following my nose no. to see if there was a story there <laughs> and then there potentially is and it's um yeah it's freedom it's real freedom to just yeah. figure it out for yourself mm. i don't feel like that really because i feel like in order to be at the point where um i'd receive this fellowship i'm really good at putting a lot of pressure on myself mm -hmm. so i really i wouldn't ever need um any extra pressure from the structure of the fellowship um and, and i think that experience has is definitely the experience of the other um, recipients that I know that I've spoken to before have said, um, actually sent me emails and said just, just relax. You know, don't don't put don't pile extra pressure on yourself to live up to the um, position that mm -hmm. you've got. So mm -hmm. there, there's no pressure in a way, but there also, as it probably comes more internally. Mm. It's a wonderful freedom. Mm -hmm. Yes, Chris, are you? Are you happy to sit and do nothing, or do you? Uh, <laughs> well, or? The, the freedom is really nice, and actually, I, what I'm doing this year, I've had lined up for for quite some time, so there there was still pressure in a way to do this. But um, before uh, before I came down here, um, about sort of four or five months before, I'd been working at uh, Radio New Zealand uh, on the concert program. I was a producer for that, and then. Um, I received a redundancy out of my own um, choosing. I chose to receive a redundancy, um, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of that up there. I'll say no more. Um, and um, after after that happened, so uh, the, the first day I had off, having to go into radio, I, or the first kind of week or something, I said, "Wow, I'm getting so much done. I've got all these days to myself." And so you know, you start and you write masses of stuff and you still respond to emails which I'm not very good at and um, and that's sort of writing waves now sometimes you have uh, down days where you, where you don't do a hell of a lot and, and you just have a cup of coffee and uh, nurse your weary head sometimes um, and, and that's that's just kind of how it goes but I do have to keep on top of things I can't um, when you've got things lined up when, when you know that you have to get on to the next piece you can't just uh, sort of sit back too much mm, mm. and let it pass by mm. so Barbara have you made good use of your time <laughs> <laughs> Not checking apart from right buying now. a house yeah. <laughs> um, yes I, I think so I mean I, I, I won't complete the novel in, in the six months but I think I'll, I'll have a second draft that I'm that I'm very happy with. I'm getting very excited about it now because I think I have found the voice. I found how to put energy into it. Um, the structure I realised last week. The structure is a heck of a lot better than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So you know, mm -hmm. I'm um, mm -hmm. feeling very up about that. I think the um, and I hope I'll have it completed or completed by the end of the year. But the the value of the fellowship, and this is going to sound incredibly antisocial, is that you can just write. You don't, or think about the writing. You don't have to do anything else. Um, and a deadline would be would be awful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think any any writer anyway should should work to a deadline because I think it. Um, you know, no matter what some people say about oh, I, you know, I finish things much more quickly if I've got a deadline and I'm happy with that. And well. Really, you know, I think giving yourself as much time as 
the particular project needs is, is, is a safer way to go. Um, but I, I've just really enjoyed the, um, the lack of responsibility to anything else except, except the novel. Mm. It's, it's been marvellous. True artist speaking here. Yeah. Oh, mm. um, thank you. I'd lay out like to, what's the word, open it to the floor. So if anybody would have any questions they wish to ask of the fellows. Now we do have a um, roaming microphone. Well, the microphone's not roaming. Linda will roam with it. <laughs> For anybody who wishes to ask a question, uh, please use the microphone so that we can all hear the question. And the time starts now. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, Barbara, if you put yourself around children to hear dialogue or thoughts. Um... You certainly get a lot out of um, associating with with children in in that way. You hear hear the speech patterns and you can um, use them or or adapt them because you you don't you don't want to use exactly the kind of dialect for want of a, another word that is being used at the moment because by the time the novel mm. might be published mm. it'll be well out of date. So you've got to you know choose. It, it, it's like selecting the one or two details that will um, pin a scene down or ground it in some way. The, the dialogue, the dialogue choice, choice of words and dialogue has to pin it somehow into the character, has to somehow illuminate the character. Um, that said, it's marvellous going into schools, um, although it's often very distracting to, to the writing process, but it's good going into schools and, and having um, interaction with with pupils about mm. about reading and writing, mm. so you, you really do need to be in touch with with the readership. Yeah. Ah, here's a question down the front. Um. I just wondered how you do you hear the do you hear the do you hear the music in your head? I mean if you say you're not producing yeah. it, is it in here that you hear it all? Yeah, so um I I'm a pencil and paper composer and um and so I uh, just write straight straight out in full score. Um I don't have perfect pitch. But I use a, a tuning fork to give to give myself a reference pitch, and I can work everything else out from that. Um, but bas basically, for most composers, I think their training allows allows for this, and and we do quite rigorous uh, oral training. Mm -hmm. uh, that that means that you um, that you can sort of imagine at sight a whole score or you can imagine um, or when you hear things you, you can sort of picture it written down that's mm -hmm. that's part of the, the the musicianship training that um, that we get and that we've it's it's almost always been that way I hope it doesn't fall over actually because <laughs> kids these days they rely quite heavily on the headphones and, and yeah. keyboards and so um, but it's yeah that's a, a an important part of my training was was being able to um, imagine sound um, and imagine orchestral texture that's that's um, a complex and complicated thing but um, but it's yeah just something that I feel feel very secure with now and actually I read music much faster than I read words. Like wow. it's it's much mm. much more fluid for me. Yeah. So do you write in full score from word go? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. pretty yeah. smart, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm. <laughs> 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 it might be better. If, uh, there's something about the feedback. I'm sorry, Johnny's coming on the moon and still the DVD, so he's not here. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. No squeaking. A little bit. Just a little bit. Don't of speak too loud. All right. Um, I'm David Searle, and um, I love to dance to music, and I love interpreting dance. And I'm just wondering whether or not 
composer is aware that um, he's interpreting your, your music and uh, whether or not you have in mind the dancer. You're talking about um, specifically composing for dance or just the inherent kind of um, dance-like quality of music? Is that Yes, yep. because I think anything can be danced to. Yeah, I guess um, there's so many possibilities with uh, with musical shape, and I, th I think dance is definitely one of those things. Dance has, has its own sort of physical shape as well. Um, for me, I think of uh, music as having its own uh, dramaturgy, rather than kind of a um, rather than a sort of a, a drama or a theatricality that I would. Um, that I would imagine directly as a kind of binary relationship. I wouldn't imagine that something would necessarily have to be in any particular way. I think of, um, I, I think quite a lot about um, the way musical character and shape exists in space, and that could be um, in terms of uh, temporal space. So the kind of way it occupies time, how it how it unfolds over time. It could be in physical space, the way it resonates around the room, um, and it could also be in um, what I'd call harmonic space, so how how the how dense the chords are or how open the chords are, things like that. Um, I think create a sense of uh, a sense of drama, I guess, but more a sense of dramaturgy, where there's where they're interacting like what you might want to say, characters or sort of um, elements of, of some kind of dramatic ritual. Um, and that's, I guess that's a little bit outside your question, but it's, um, it's just one of those, it means that dance is one of those kind of possibilities. It's something that exists in physical space and, and can represent music, um, but I don't think necessarily specifically of that. It's one of many possibilities that you can does that make sense? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, Victor, whether there's a play or have you moved into more fiction? Because you mentioned you had something published in Landfall that was a genre that you weren't used to writing. Mm, definitely a play. Um, uh, and the, uh, the piece in Landfall maybe the beginning of the novel. <laughs> I mean, it's such a different discipline for me, you know? It's, mm -hmm. I take my hats off to, mm -hmm. um, to fiction writers. It's, um, yeah, I'm very excited about it. And it's largely inspired by yeah, um, a couple of the actors that I've used this year, um, local actors for the readings here at the gallery, and um, <clears throat> three young high school kids that I worked with recently, uh, Southland high school kids. And it's all kind of, it's been a perfect storm of inspiration for me for this piece, so who knew? But yeah, yeah, it will be a play, and that, that will be part of the last um, play reading that I do uh, in November here. Yeah. You said then that you are, you take your hat off to, to writers and to novelists. Um, why do you do that? Because you're writing a story, you're writing a story in a two-hour um reading, shall we say, or whether it's a play, which is only sort of 60 or so pages, you've got to tell a whole story from beginning to end in that time, whereas Barbara can do 30,000 words and only be halfway through <laughs> to tell her story. So True. why do you, so is your storytelling, well, you, you'll give the impression that, that yours is the easier option. No, you no, take I, it, I don't no? mean to, it's just no? a different discipline a very different that discipline. I admire, and yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, I love... Um, I love reading, and I, this is probably the most I've read for a long time this year, and I've really um, mm -hmm. uh, delved into a lot of New Zealand writers who I don't often read. And, um, yeah, I just love how, well, same with theatre, but with fiction, I love how people can, you know, I can cry. There are a few books I've cry, cried or laughed out loud, you know, just to digress. I mean, I always think of reading um, A Confederacy of Dancers by um, John Kennedy Toole. I don't know if any of you know that book, but this guy took his life. And then his mother got it published 10 years later and it won the Pulitzer. And I was, as I was laughing out loud, um, reading it, I thought, gosh, how sad he's not here to see that it, that it worked. And it's affecting this kid from New Zealand. You know, and The Road, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, that's the book that's really um, uh, 
affected me the most in recent years. But why I admire fiction writers is it's a, a, because it's a different discipline for me. Mm. Very different, very, very different discipline for me. Mm. You know, playwriting, I, I'm very, it's like my first language. Um, writing fiction would probably be my fourth or fifth. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I admire it when it's done well. Mm. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, all four if you can look back in your create careers and see when the original spark occurred. Mm. Go. Me? Oh, oh I don't know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so far back probably that um, it's lost in the mists of my childhood. I, I used to write mm. plays when I was seven or eight and, mm. and you know get my class to perform them and that was rather odd because I was incredibly shy as a child and the teacher couldn't get a word out of me but when it came to <laughs> doing that sort of thing, I was, you know, really bossy. <laughs> um, so I've always been interested in telling story um, in, in, in some sort of form. So, And I, it probably comes from being brought up in a house where stories were read, music was played, um, books were just part of the furniture, you know, absolutely, you know, stuffed bookcases sort of bursting with piles, you know. It's yeah, that's the same um, for me, being surrounded by um, art in my family and I started um, drawing and painting when I was just a small child and just never wanted to stop doing that. Um, and my mother always wanted to be an artist but she became a nurse because in the time that um, she would have gone to university. She was she got to choose between being a teacher or a nurse, really, and her brother was sent off to uni. Um, so she's always supported that, you know, that I could become an artist. It's, and it's really important to have that support too. To That's a really good question. I mean, um, I think uh, it takes me back to intermediate when I, for some reason, I got hooked on these books called Perry Roden, which were a science fiction series. And I started doing my own version called Laszlo Jenner was my science fiction hero. And I used to do these regularly just for my own entertainment. And I guess that, that sort of was the spark back then, wanting to tell stories. When I was quite little, I, I always liked writing music. But when I was little, that it was pretty pretty dumb. It was like little sort of stupid ditties that um that didn't really make much sense. But I was always interested in it. In at high school, uh, our music class had a really wonderful itinerant um, composition teacher. So somebody who would come in one day a week and um and just look at our composition projects. A guy named Gary Wilby, um, good composer and yeah. Um, good person, um, but he introduced us and me to to music of the avant-garde, so like Stockhausen, Boulez, uh, Lutosławski, these sort of sorts of composers. And I, th and uh, the moment I heard them, I my mind was blown. I, I couldn't couldn't believe what was now possible. You know what what um, the kind of universe that was available to me through this mechanism, through through being able to write music, and so. Um, from then on in, it's just been uh, towards exploration, and that's that's towards uh, finding extremes, and that's been a beautiful thing for me. Is that all right? Hold it down. That's I good. like to ask Victor actually, sort of a frivolous sort of a question. Um, getting back to script writing, you said you wrote script for Shortland Street, which I haven't seen for about 20 years. How does the script writer take over from former script writer? You have to keep up the continuity, and yet you're not really interested but you've still got to keep it on. And the reason I ask that, I read a book years ago, and uh, 
It was on a cruise ship, and every chapter was done by a different writer. Now, each writer in their own right who wrote books were excellent, but as a book, everyone doing a different chapter, it was the most terrible book mm. I've ever right. disjointed. Right. So how do you, you continue on? So uh, as a script writer, so say, you're, say I was doing a script next week, um, so there'd be five writers and we'd all be working from the same, what we call a storyline. Mm. So that's the Bible that we all know why our character suddenly doesn't have a leg or why they're sleeping with someone else as opposed to last week. <laughs> so we all kind of uh, understand the continuity of the story. So hopefully that keeps us on the same page and keeps us from being disjointed like the example you just gave. And then the safety net for that are the script editors <clears throat> who kind of like mark it, so to speak, at the end. <laughs> yes. And they're the, they're the ones that also are trying to keep it in line so that the person <laughs> without the leg still doesn't have <laughs> one leg <laughs> instead of miraculously getting a new leg <laughs> on the Friday episode. So yeah, that's your question. <laughs> Um, Nicholas said he didn't want to ask any political questions, but it occurred to me that most of what you do, to, certainly in terms of drama, visual arts, music, maybe not quite so much literature, is sort of dumbed, not dumbed down, but um, not seen as a priority, particularly in secondary education. And I mean, I for one worry about that. I worry about STEM subjects and how much they're advocated for, particularly by the government. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a responsibility to kind of be advocating for the arts? And if you had the chance to to advocate for what you do uh, being available to children in high schools as a priority, what would you you know what would you say? Mm. It's one of those things. Um, knowledge, you know, like the university format of knowledge for its own sake instead of knowledge as a means to an end which is more the training politic kind of route mm. and that that is something that's maybe not seen as as valuable as it should be and it's losing value um, but that that process is so important like as a human being and it feeds into everything else in your life um, I would like an opportunity at some point to work in a university and I just like hope the positions are still around when I come to that point. Because, yeah, mm. it's a bit scary. Yeah, the, the sort of focus on outcomes mm. is, is really problematic for the arts. Mm. The outcomes are, are never clear, mm. they're, they're never singular. But that's that's really the the driving force of everything these days, including education, and it's um, it's a problem, N not just for the arts, but yeah, for the for the arts, it's it's really um, sometimes things should just exist, sometimes they they should just go, they should just happen, and um, and it's really hard to convince the powers that be that that, that that's a good idea. There's no good PR in that, you know. No. And you can't, on the one hand, ask um, an artist or anyone to have a sort of the freedom of mind to question things and then to, at the same time, have to function within a capitalist system and tune up results. Mm. So that, they don't fit together. This, this may not answer your question, but you know, part of the reason I'm sitting here as the Robert Burns Fellow is because as a high school student I got to see Foreskin's Lament, I got to see Little Shop of Horrors, I got to see Torch Song Trilogy, I got to see Limbs do their stuff. You know, my, my third play, Rantus Tantrum, was named because of Douglas Wright's piece, Rantus Tantrum. Yeah. You know, and I hope, um, yeah, I don't know, quite know how to answer your question, but on, on a tangent, you know, I'm meeting with the Ministry of Education um, in Wellington next month because, you know, I teach, I, have, I, I like teaching particularly PI kids at high schools. And if I, as a award-winning playwright, Robert Burns Fellow, <laughs> am struggling trying to decipher that um, curriculum, <coughs> and if the teacher that those kids has doesn't know how to translate that curriculum into their language, then they're stuffed. Mm -hmm. And I really, as a writer, um, you know, I'm all about language, and I really detest the language of the, the curriculum. Mm -hmm. That doesn't quite answer your question, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's where I'm at. And, um, you know, the, the, 
the saying, in terms of the political, I mean, I'm getting, I think all my work has been political to a, to a degree, be it personal or, or more overt, but, you know, the one saying that I really hold true to more and more as I get older and approach 50 is, um, <laughs> you know, art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Mm -hmm. And what I see more and more is um, there's not a lot of discomfort going on in theatres and I think I, I, I really crave that because I don't think an audience should just be able to sit there and not engage or, um, you know, Feel, yeah. move around a bit mm. uncomfortably. I think there, there needs to be a little bit of... <laughs> Yeah, and, and everything in music too. There's a, a you know, New Zealand could really do with a bit of a kick in the pants mm. in terms of um, the contemporary music that happens. Uh, some of our major organisations are really shying away from it, and um, and it, it's problematic. And we're not really supposed to speak out because we might miss our opportunity. And so, um, yeah, but it's they could really um, they could really start to implore some of the kind of more extreme and um, and more subversive elements that are available in our art form, I think. Mm. Homogeneity is death to the arts, you know. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like to add something, although you, you didn't include writing in, in, in the question. I, I've noticed, um, and I think other writers might have noticed this too, with, when it comes to books being used in secondary schools, there are often issues driven rather than good quality writing. Yeah. And I would much prefer to see good quality writing through which the reader can pick out their own messages. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really think publishers need to you know, smarten up a, a, about that. And uh, so I think the curriculum has got quite a bit to answer for mm. <laughs> that way. Any publishers in the room? <laughs> um, any more questions? If not, I'll wrap this up. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I would like to um, thank the University of Otago and Stephanie Evans for holding this together for us this afternoon, for uh, Linda Cullen, and to uh, Johnny Chapman, who's just left the room, um, who has been looking after us here. And thank you for coming. And um, to the fellows, Chris, Victor, Miranda and Barbara, for your time this afternoon, for some interesting discussions. Um, and I'd now like to, yes, there we are, thank you, Linda, uh, invite you to linger a while um, for afternoon tea. Thank you.